Welcome to the Infinidat 2023 technical video series. This will be the first of many Infinidat solution videos provided to introduce the art of the possible for enhancing your organization's storage ecosystem with improved benefits of operations, performance, data protection, availability, and cybersecurity. My name is Brian Stover, and I am the director of America Presales here at Infinidat. Today, I will provide insights into working with our initial platform, the award-winning Infinibox. This video will touch on many of our features provided by Infinibox along with navigational basics. As our video series continues, we will delve deeper into more specific use case and operational demonstrations of several of the elements previewed here today. So let's get started. When you see this screen, this is the Infinibox dashboard. Uh, this is the uh, top of the screen is the status and health bar that will remain no matter where you are at uh, viewing the system. On the left, you'll actually see how you configure the system and it's the navigation pane. Um, in the middle of it is essentially the dashboard. It gives you the system configuration overview um, at this moment in time. So you can see the capacity, you can see events that are actually uh, taking place or real time being updated. You see a little bit more about the configuration configuration and the model of the system that we have, and then the data sets and the elements that have been configured. Um, if you've also noticed up in here, it's telling us in that health status that the node is not protected um, by the uh, a specific BBU. Um, I could click on this element here. I could come over and click on the array itself over here, um, or I could come to system health. So you're gonna always have different ways to navigate and get into um, looking at, at a specific element uh, or function that you would like to address. Let's get started with settings. This would be where you would come in at the very beginning when your array is set up. As Soon as the engineering team that installed it is done, you would come in and have a few other elements that you would con uh, configure. Likely the first thing you're gonna do is configure users. You could have local users, or you could have LDAP users, and you can see we have a series of different ones created. Um, if I scroll over here, um, this is where I would configure LDAP uh, to begin. So it's pretty basic uh, setup, very intuitive if you've configured Active Directory or open LDAP for other platforms, uh, other devices, this is where you would bring it in. And notice that we support uh, secure LDAP as well. I'm gonna cancel out of this. If we come back into the basics uh, settings that we hear, we're gonna go ahead and start with the network interfaces because uh, that's kind of the building block up. Um, and in this situation, you're gonna see that we've created port groups. These are going to become logical entities that you will assign to network spaces, which we will get to here in just a moment. And uh, it's letting me know that I've got different ports um, on node two that have been aggregated together to create a port group. So I have a bond that I've created and these are ethernet ports. Um, the network interfaces are only going to be uh, referring to the ethernet interfaces. We have a specific tab over here for fiber channel. And this gives me an understanding of how the system is connected to fiber channel switches and the zoning uh, that is created uh, that creates this map that you see here. And I can again, look at different nodes in the system by now, um, you've noticed that our architecture is a three node architecture. These are the controllers that um, work together in a cluster. Uh, if we move along inside of uh, looking at events and system health, uh, we would have the ability to send out uh, notifications via SNM, uh, SMTP, uh, SNMP, or syslog. And it's pretty straightforward if we come back into SMTP, for example, um, and I wanted to look at specific event rules, I could click on what is this customer one, scroll over here to the right, click on the three buttons and say, modify the configuration. I can look at the name that was set forth here, the address, the ports, and whether I wanted to use secure transmit or not. If we move a little bit uh, further, uh, one of the things is we have a uh, quality of service that's in here as well, so that if you wanted to create um, the ability to limit, if let's say you were a, a managed service provider and you wanted to ensure that some customers um, that tend to be a little bit busier than others, and you have service that, uh, level organizations and service level agreements that are defined, this is how you would set those in place. Um, one of the other things is let's just go ahead and talk about these network spaces since we haven't. This is where you would define whether on the ethernet port, uh, ports or port groups, you want to use 
uh, iSCSI, NFS, um, or potentially use them for WAN replication. Uh, one of the other network services is SMB. This is a little bit more uh, advanced in that you apply security features and other elements here for Active Directory. So you can see this is what it looks like here. Um, if we quickly come over here and we start looking at all the other elements that are inside of the system, events are, uh, everything is actioned in here. You're going to see Anything that takes place based on the user and the timestamp, they will be logged here. You can create event rules here, and these event rules are then what are used to then advertise via syslog or SNM, SNMP or SMTP. Um, if we come back over to system health, working our way up, uh, this is what we saw at the beginning. We noticed that that uh, node error had a BBU error. If we mouse over any of these elements at the top, I can see that there's a BBU that has an error state. If I finish going down over the nodes, you'll notice that this is telling me the node that's impacted, that it doesn't have the BBU protection. So it has one leg of power um, that's uh, raw feed, and then it has another leg of power that's coming from the BBU. Uh, if I were to look into one of these nodes, let's say node one, I can click on that and it's showing me what it looks like from the front, all of the different drives that are in here. The first eight drives are used for the operating system and then the rest of them are used for extended read cache. If I want to look at the back of this system, I can quickly take a look at how are these Ethernet ports that we saw under the settings and the interfaces down here at the beginning, it'll let me know that they are lit up. It'll let me know that they have link or connectivity. So it just gives me a view if I need to uh, give somebody an instruction about how to view the system uh, from a physical view in a data center. If you noticed also in here, we had, these are the enclosures. This is where the persistent media is actually residing. Um, it's letting me know that I have a drive uh, that has failed in there. If I click on this, it'll open it up and it'll give you the cabinet view so you could walk somebody through. Uh, you would notice that it's on the right-hand side, it's in the second row and it's in the second position. And by the way, this drive physically in the data center, it would have a blue light indicating that it has an error uh, while all the other ones are actually black. If we come back over here to setting up our hosts, um, if I was going to use any of those hosts or clusters inside of any of those uh, protocols that we had listed earlier, Fiber Channel or uh, any of the Ethernet protocols, this is where you would come in and you can create a cluster simply by coming over here and clicking on create, or you'll notice we have hosts. Uh, the hosts, 95% of the time, are uh, registered automatically by the server teams. They will be the ones using a utility that we provide called Host Power Tools, and it will automatically register uh, the host, define it here. So, and if you have the zoning that has already been set up, um, or the path management that's been set up, then it will automatically define that for you. So if I were to click on, uh, um, this is one of my hosts right here that I use in the environment. This is letting me know um, it does have host power tools installed. It tells me about the version um, that it's actually installed and then what I'm running. This is a Linux operating system and I'm using it for iSCSI. So you can get a little bit of information about all of the hosts in your environment. If we come up here to the pools, pools are logical constructs that we use for uh, managing storage and allocating who can access that storage. I can create uh, authorized users to different pools. I can have an admin, I can have a pool admin, or I can have a user. And that pool admin allows users uh, to simply come in and provision their own storage so that the storage team doesn't need to do that. And that can be done through CLI, or it could be done through um, using the... Uh, host power tools on the actual server. So at this point, uh, if we were to move into data sets, data sets are volumes and file systems. And you can see there are a litany of these that are actually created here. There are also consistency groups. And then we also support VVOLs and then VVOL replications. Um, one of the things that I find interesting is that Right now we're navigating and we're leveraging this via a GUI. I mentioned that we can do things through a CLI, but before we do that, let's come over here. I have obviously have elements that are created on this. So I'm just gonna type in beast over and using this search function, it lets me see anything in the system, whether it's a file system, a pool or a, any element that's created that has beast over, it's gonna locate it. So I wanna go into my beast over pool and when I'm inside of here, you're going to see that I can now take a look at the different file systems that are in here, the volumes, they can reside in the same pool. Um, you'll notice that these elements are different 
icons, file systems have folder, volumes have a uh, barrel notation. If I want to look at the arrow next to it or expand it, I can see that these also have snapshots. And some of these are expired snapshots. Some of these are locked. That means I've created immutable snapshots or non-immutable snapshots. That the, that's the differentiation that's here. Um, one of the things, if we come back up to the top, we have a file system that's listed here. So as I was mentioning, we could navigate this through a GUI. Um, I have another uh, system up here that if we wanted to come in and look at this from a, I'm sorry, I went to the search button. I can come in and I can navigate this through the CLI. I came over to the upper right-hand side. And if I select Infinish Shell, uh, as you can see, I had Infinish Shell up earlier. And what I was doing was finding out how could I locate this via a CLI command. So I uh, was navigating. And if I use a command called FS query, and then I grep for B Stover, I'm actually going to return these two file systems that have the begin with B Stover. And if I scroll over here to the right hand side, I can see one is for Unix and one is for Windows. So I'm just showing you the power that you can rehearse things through CLI on this platform and then use an off tool called Infinite CLI. Or you can finish navigating uh, in the GUI. If I come back into the dashboard, Again, I'm going to come back over back to that pool, beast over, because I want to take a shortcut to it. I could navigate over here on the side and say pools and then scroll down and find beast over. But this is the more elegant way of getting to where I want. I have a beast over FS01. What if I wanted to poll the system uh, via API in an automated fashion? So if I'm going to come over here and break this out. I can start typing in API. REST file system, and then I've already pre-set this up that I want to look for this file system via API. It's telling me now here's every element that I was looking at in the GUI um, from the name, the type, the size, security elements. But what if I wanted to shorten this and I wanted to do a filter and I wanted to say, let me know just um, specific fields. So here I'm going to ask for fields of name and the type and then the size of this, and I'm going to hit enter. So now I can narrow it down. And this is an API get. Um, you can do posts. You can action anything that I'm doing through this GUI. You can actually leverage through the API. So um, one of the other things that we haven't touched on over here is replication. Um, in this situation, the first thing you would do is you would come in and you would set up the links or establish the connectivity. And this system, you can see we have a relationship between uh, Infinibox 2233 and 2817 and an active-active replication pair. Or I have an async replication that is set up between Infinibox 2233 and 2503. So we support um, synchronous replication, asynchronous replication, active active, and then also a, um, a federated. I could have asynchronous links off of this frame to another one and another one. So um, many different options uh, for replication. We also support VVOL replication, as you saw earlier. Nobody has anything set up in this state. Um, and if we were to come back here, this is just showing me um, all of the different volumes or the file systems that are in a replication pairing um, and whether they are listed as a source or a target. And I can look at RPO states. Um, those are defined at the time of when I create a replication pair. I would come in, tell the system what type of replication do I want to create, a sync. I can please choose a, a remote system in here. So in this situation, I would say, let's go to uh, 2817, for example. I could choose a volume or a file system, and I could start typing in my name. So if I started typing in one of the volumes I have here, I can select it. And then you'll notice it automatically creates um, on the other side what should be created when I would hit create, and it depends the name target. In this situation, I'm going to go ahead and kick cancel. Um, just again, showing you the power of it. The last thing that we haven't gone over is performance. Um, we noticed up here that we had the health warning, but we also have operations. We can see there's not much NAS operations that's going on, but there's a decent amount of uh, SAN or block operations that are actually going on. When I come in here, the intro dashboard, and this is real time. If I wanted to look at this long term or trending, I would look at something, an external tool called Infinimetrics. We'll dive into that in other sessions. But again, looking here, I can see the latency that's going on um, for both SAN and NAS. I, if I want to shut off the NAS because I know I don't have any blocks, then I don't have that red line. It's just showing me the latency of that. 
If I wanted to see, hey, let me learn a little bit more. Who's driving this load? What's going on? I can use the add top table and I selected hosts. And now I can see which hosts are running, um, what type of operations, which is the throughput that they're driving out of that um, roughly 500 megabytes of data set that is running. And then I can see the latency that is actually taking place on these hosts individually. So as you can see, uh, it's a pretty robust platform, very easy to navigate, uh, a lot of feature sets that we will be going into and delving into over the course of our video series. And I thank you for your time.